Okay. We welcome the next speaker, Sebastian Schall. Hello, um, my name is Sebastian Schall. I'm coming from the company Artocube Systems. And today I want to give you a quick introduction about who Artocube is. I will show you some uh, currently uh, distributed cryos that's on the market. I will introduce a new compressor technology to you. And then I will talk with you a bit about the vision of new, even more compact cryostat systems, because when we want to go in from academia into the field, I think making everything much smaller is a must have in future developments. So Autocube was founded in 2001. We are now 20 years old. We just had our uh, 20 year celebrations. We have 220 employees at the moment, so already are quite a big company. We have two offices in Berkeley and the main office in Munich, and many distribution offices around the world, so you can get local support from us as well. We integrated in the Wittenstein Group, one of the hidden champions in Germany, and if you especially look at the group structure, you will see that everything is based around moving things. For example, if I have to have a surgery in the future, what I hope is that the, the robot doing the, the surgery is equipped, for example, with the Wittenstein Galaxy gearbox, because that would make it much more precise. Um, Autocube itself from the structure is structured into three business units, motion sensing, cryogenics instruments, and nanoscale analytics to better understand the needs of our customers. So we try to uh, specialize in the direction of our customers with these business units. And I'm coming from cryogenics instruments, and today I will talk, as said, about cryostats. I want to show you a picture of our factory, not just to show how shiny it is, but uh, uh, if you look at the pictures of our working environment, that's also how people feel, how, how you live is how you feel. So we have a very open culture, a very um, nice culture in the factory. And I want to advertise that we have open positions. Um, if you know someone who is looking for a job in industry, please advertise us. We are looking for physicists. We are looking for engineers, especially now also um, mechanical engineers or industrial mechanics. So if you know anyone, please let them know we are looking for people. Now let's talk about the Auto Dry series. The Auto Dry series is a well-established series of cars that's most probably you know it already from some of your labs or your colleagues' labs. Um, small but nice, the r 800. The idea here is to really give back the optical table to the researcher. We don't put a big cryostat on the optical table, but we do it a bit smarter. We put it from below into the optical table so you are not disturbed by hoses or or wires on your optical table. Everything that needs to be done for the cryostat is done below the table on the floor where it doesn't disturb, where it doesn't rattle your optics. Very nice solution. So you can basically work on this table like on a usual optical table and you can make use of the cold plate which is sitting on exactly the same level as your optical table. So you basically, the, the attempt is to work on the system in 4 Kelvin, just similar to working in room temperature. Second system on this slide is the Arto Dry 1000. This is a different concept. It's a top loading cryostat where we can pack in massive magnets up to 12 Tesla or vector magnets from uh, one Tesla vector field up to a big 522 Tesla vector magnet. The third one, the Arto Dry 2100 is basically the, the bigger brother of the 1000. It additionally has a variable temperature insert. So we equip the cryostat not only with a 
with a pulse tube which has two cooling stages, one at 40 Kelvin, one at 4 Kelvin. But additionally, we do an undercooling of a small helium circuit where we can go then to 1.6 Kelvin with this system. Let's look a bit in detail on the Arto Dry 800. Basically, this is the, I could talk now for an hour only about this system because this is the system that actually brought me to Arto Cube. Um, what I especially like is this experiment. There are, we have built about 30, 40 different experiments on this cryostat already for our customers. Of course, some alone from this experiment, I would say we have 30 in the field, more than 30 maybe 40 in the field. And the special thing about this experiment is that we have a, an objective sitting at four Kelvin. If you look at this old textbook picture, it's exactly as old as I am from 1983. You can see that the thermal expansion curve of titanium is basically flat if I go below 40 Kelvin, which means as soon as I start cooling down my optics, they don't move anymore. I can tune on my quantum dots in here and I don't have to readjust. I can really work over weeks on the same dot without having the hassle of readjusting my optics inside the cryostat. I'm completely independent of lab temperature changes and that's what makes this instrument so strong and what helps your people in the lab to, establish, uh, to accomplish the work that they have to do. Let's go over to the Arto 2100. I mentioned that uh, we can equip this with massive magnet. Why magnets? Why do I say this? In principle, I can also work with magnets on the Arto 800. We can uh, give you a solution where I have a magnet, but going back quickly, the nice thing on the system, where's my pointer? The nice thing here is actually that I have so much space that I can work so conveniently if I start putting a magnet around this, it's not so nice anymore. And big issue, if I start putting a big magnet on the four Kelvin plate, then I'm gaining a lot of cool down time. So I'm losing it agility. And that's the reason why I want to put it into this cryostat. Here I'm using a top loading mechanism where I have a stick where my experiment sits. I can basically work on the experiment without having the magnet in the way. When I want to go into the magnet, into the cryostat, I put it down. It's just a meter long stick. So this is not like old cryostat where I had a crane where you had two meter long sticks, but this is only one meter long. I can, if I'm a tall man person, I can basically put it in with my hand uh, without even going on a step. So this is also some security reason, no ladders, no steps anymore, or just small steps. Um, and then the cool down time. Please look at the red curve here. This is a cool down curve of a standard confocal microscopy insert. Um, I put down the insert and I'm cool within three or four hours inside a big vector magnet. Here we show a nine Tesla vector magnet, a nine Tesla magnet. And also for the vector magnet, it's basically the same time. So I'm very, very quick in getting my samples out, putting them back in. In contrast, if I would always have to heat up and cool down the vector magnet, I'm spending days just for, uh, just for warming it up and cooling it down. So here I can work much more agile if something is wrong on my sample, on my adjustment, I get it out. I do it, I correct it, put it back in, and I'm measuring again within one day. Infrastructure, the next part of the talk will mainly be on infrastructure. Let's also talk about infrastructure on this system. What I need to drive a cryostat is always a compressor, which compresses the helium that does the adiabatic expansion in my pulse tube or in my cold head system. So this is a must have. On this system, we use a 7.2 kilowatt compressor. To get the heat away, I need at the end a water cooling system of nine kilowatts. Um, for the third expansion, 
um, of the helium as said i want to go from the uh, three to four kelvin that my pulse tube in the system generates down to 1.6 kelvin so i need an additional helium circle this is done with this circulation pump it's a dry circulation pump and a storage tank for the helium and with this extra circle i can do another uh, expansion cycle of the helium i can encapsulate this there is not much heat generated into the room i can drive away everything or nearly everything with the with the cooling water so this is also efficient i, I wouldn't be too hesitant with using water cooling because it's also an elegant way you have commercial coolers from the food industry very cheap very reliable that you put outside the building and like this you can get rid of these nine kilowatts i think in this power range if we go above three kilowatts 3.5 kilowatts it's more efficient to use water cooling than to try to cool away the the heat the compressor generates with the air conditioning system then this from from the point of facilities usually much more difficult and and such high heat levels high heat levels we want to go down with these heat levels we want to come into a region where we don't have to think about heat anymore where i could place my cryostat right next to me here where you can place it in your office okay you don't want to have anything in your office but where you in principle can go into your uh, where you can cool away the the heat with any air conditioning system in any server room in the world and that's what we came up with it's a already established compressor technology as you can see on the left side you can easily slide it into a rack and like this store it away in a server room or in a lab you can have it on on wheels standing around under a table so you're completely free and where you put it and now the special thing comes um, if anyone has ever read a manual of a compressor we use today the first thing it reads don't tilt the compressor if you tilt the classical compressor by more than 45 degrees for air conditioning system for your cryostat it's gone the reason is that in a usual compressor system you use a capsule that mixes the helium gas and the oil then you use that's that's needed for the compression and also for the cooling of the helium and then you go into a separator where you separate again the oil from the helium but if you tilt it the separator will not work the uh, the oil will go into the four line and your system is gone so why can i tilt this guy uh, to answer this we will have a look inside uh, there is not something like a classical capsule like a scroll capsule but what you use is basically a two-cylinder motor to drive the helium through the circle here's a sketch we have a gear pump that is driven by this blue electrical motor the blue is can also be seen here um, and the oil is driven into one or the other cylinder where it compresses a bellows filled with helium gas so we have a counteracting mechanism of two bellows to get a constant flow of helium which is controlled by these check valves here the special thing of this is that we have a 100 clean operation we have no mixing of the oil and helium which means that there cannot be a contamination of your cryocooler system coming from the oil which is in the compressor this, this adds a lot of reliability let's look at the key figures it's autonomous i have an air cooling I have a very low heat generation, about one kilowatt, as said. Uh, that, that's similar to a server, like our servers at Articube, we have four of them, or everyone generates 900 watts at maximum. So I can easily place another server, and I can easily place my compressor into the server room if I want to. Because if a server room doesn't have this capacity anymore, it's already overloaded. 
then anyways, I need to do some infrastructure work at one point. It's single phase. I can plug it in into one of these plugs. If I have a strong household wall plug with 16 amps, I could even be so keen and put three things on one wall plug at my home. It's compact. I put it into a 19-inch rack. It has seven height units in the, in the rack. And it's mobile. So the, the, the first customers we have for the systems actually are using it for a real mobile application. They are putting this compressor on a truck and are driving it through the mountains on rough roads. And they didn't manage to break it so far. All they broke is the generators on the trucks. So it's a really rough machine. It's, it's not like in the past where you got something delivered and you have to collect at first the screws and put them back in. But this is a really tough machine. It's reliable. We have a full circle separation and uh, real adaptive power. So I can go different power steps, what I can't do with the oil circulation. And it's versatile. We can talk about the versatility and integration possibilities later. Now let's come quickly to the vision. What we want to do with the setup is a very, very small um, cryostat system, basically just placing a small cryostat on the basis of this compressor. Same benefits, you have a very low heat generation, you just place it in your lab and you don't have to worry. I think this is a nice solution, especially in the OEM supply when you have a startup, you don't want to worry about your cryostats, you buy them, you deliver them to the customer and the customer does nothing but putting them in, into a rack, plugging it in, very easy. Quick preview of the next step in the Arctic 800 project, uh, Arctic 800 XS. So we want to have a solution for very small labs as well. And that's what we want to achieve with the Arctic 800 XS, where we have basically the same key figures like on the big Arctic 800 system inside the optical table, but much, much smaller. Good. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker for this talk. Nice talk. So the organizer's question of first, uh, what do you think will be the main use case? And then what will be the main challenge for entanglement assisted communication? Network? Um, use case, uh, I think at some point we will lose the money from the governments. So the the technology has to go the way where the most money is in the end. And my interpretation is that especially banks will have the money, the financial business will have the money, and we will see a lot of quantum applications in the financial business, which means that we need to have maybe a network between banks. And when we look into security, Companies are interested in security because you have to fight day by day hacker attacks. So I can imagine that quantum will be key in middle to large size uh, industry and in the financial business. Which possibility do you see uh, for quantum technology to contribute the 6G? Um, maybe let's let's uh, let me add to the to the to the problems we have. The second question you had, I think the big problem is if we want to go into the field, and I hope this was a bit transferred by the talk. Um, there is some easiness in in cryostats if you can work at four Kelvin, and if you want to work in milli Kelvin or below, let's say one Kelvin, two Kelvin, uh, it's getting much more difficult. So I think. From the cooling perspectives, we will see uh, large facilities equipped with big, uh, uh, big cooling systems that we use for quantum computing, like we already do today. And I think the field usage might need to be uh, uh, done on a, on, a, on a level of three to four Kelvin. That's the biggest challenge I see to, to get the, the serviceability right. 6G. Basically the same answer. I think uh, for, my, for, for me as a person, I don't think that this extra level of security will be achievable or necessary. On the other hand, for companies, security is key. So I think 
uh, we will see discrete fiber networks where companies secure the, comp the communication from one plant to the other plant or from your R&D in Munich to your production in Berlin. But I don't see much in the mobile application, to be honest. Maybe car industry, but let's see. Thank you for the honesty. You're welcome. Um, we'll have to leave further questions to the panel. Uh, so let's thank you again.